An automobile has rear view mirrors and a windshield. I venture to say that our conversation so far today, although <clears throat> implications for the future have periodically been drawn, have tended to focus more on the rear view mirrors. <laughs> this third and final panel in our celebration of the 30th anniversary of Shorenstein A Park will look through the windshield. A reference will be made to the present, perhaps even the past, but as I encouraged my co-panelists in an email a few weeks ago, I'm hoping very much that they can look down the road to see what's coming and also where the car is going. Now, the car could be the United States, because our topic is US relations with Asia, or it could be any one of the countries or regions in Asia, or even, I suppose, even Asia itself. So that is the kind of orientation that I hope we can work within. Each speaker will have, as you know, 15 minutes, thanks to the authoritarian leadership at the back of the room. <laughs> And I cannot imagine a more talented or distinguished group of individuals to look down the road than the ones that I hasten to say you are fortunate enough to be looking at. Uh, skipping the CVs, I will simply say name by name in the order in which they are going to speak. Former US Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry. Former South Korean Foreign Minister, Sung Joo Han. Ryusei Kokubun, the president of the National Defense Academy in Japan, Lan Shui, the dean of the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua University in China, and last but not least, Southeast Asianist that I am, <laughs> Surin Pitsuan, former secretary general of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Without further ado, Bill, it's yours. Early last year, the president presented a new security strategy for the United States. By my count, this is only the fifth time the United States has had a new security strategy since the ending of the Civil War. Using a theme from President Eisenhower, who argued for the need to maintain a balance among our national security programs, President Obama stated that it was that after a decade of two costly wars, it was time to strike a new balance by rebuilding the strength of our homeland as we responsibly withdrew from Iraq and Afghanistan. Those two wars have cost us thousands of lives, tens of thousands of serious casualties, and more than a billion trillion dollars in, in dollar costs. Even those who were in favor of those wars would concede that they were a response to 9-11 rather than an outcome of any considered national security strategy. So it was long overdue that we thought through and articulated an American strategy for the current environment. So we have a new strategy. What is new about it? The president first cited the danger that violent extremists could pose catastrophic threats, including weapons of mass destruction, and he said, we will take proactive role in monitoring, containing, and when necessary, directly striking such extremists wherever they were located. We have, in fact, been doing that to some controversy this past year. The president then stated that the primary national interests of the United States were in the Asia-Pacific region, and that as we rebalance our forces, we would give highest priority to that region. In fact, in one of his early planning meetings, the president rejected a proposal to phase out one carrier task force, precisely because of the critical role that it played in Asia-Pacific security. He stated that we would emphasize and strengthen existing alliances, Japan, Korea, Australia, as the vital foundation for our Asia-Pacific security. And he cited the importance of investing in long-term strategic partnership with India as a regional economic anchor and provider of security in the broader Indian Ocean region. He said that we would work with our allies to maintain peace on the Korean Peninsula 
and reaffirmed that we will defend the Republic of Korea against any provocations from North Korea. Shortly after the President's release of this strategy, China's government media argued that this new strategy was directed against them. It certainly can be read that way, but the President tried to offset that concern by stating that the United States and China have a strong stake in peace and stability in the entire region, and that he believed that our two nations should be working to build a cooperative bilateral relationship. Having said that, he also noted that the large and sustained growth of China's military power raised questions about China's strategic intentions and said that the United States would make necessary investments to maintain regional access and the ability to operate freely in the Western Pacific. We have put a priority on the Asia-Pacific region because it is the most populous region in the world and because it is critical to our trade and to our economy. That has not always been so. The United States was definitely Eurocentric for most of the 20th century. Until the last decade of that century, we had more than 200,000 troops stationed in Europe and we had thousands of tons of prepositioned weapons that could outfit reinforcements that could be rushed to Europe in a crisis. But all of that changed with the ending of the Cold War and with the remarkable economic growth of Asia Pacific during the past three decades. People speak of the Asian miracle. Indeed, it seems that a permanent era of prosperity was on hand. In the morning session, Larry Lau laid out the economic reasons for this economic growth. And I would like to point out those economic principles will only apply if there is peace and stability in the region. And that peace and stability has been underwritten by the strong American military presence in the region. We cannot take peace and stability for granted. Indeed, the long-term history of the region is one of continuous conflict. The past three day, decades of stability, in fact, have been an exception to the historical record. So it is reasonable to ask, what could happen to disrupt this long period of stability and return the region to its historical norm of strife? First, the United States could greatly reduce or even withdraw its military forces from the region. Second, another war on the Korean Peninsula, and third, a conflict between the United States and China. We can dismiss the first contingency because the new strategy says explicitly that we are there to stay and even talks of increasing our forces. The second contingency cannot be so easily dismissed. North Korea, in the face of universal opposition, has proceeded to build and test nuclear weapons, and long-range missiles. And in the last few months, they have created an atmosphere of crisis. You all know that North Korea is a master of invective. In fact, when I was the Secretary of Defense in 1994, they first used the term that they were going to turn Seoul into a sea of flames. In that same release, press release, they also referred to the Secretary of Defense as a war maniac. That's it. I think the first and only time I've been called a war maniac. So I am, I am used to their invective. But in the last few months, I do believe the invective has set a new high or a new low, depending on how you want to rank it, including explicit threats for nuclear missiles attacking the United States, Japan, and Korea. They have also illustrated those threats with a truly bizarre cartoon video. And if you've not seen that video, I strongly recommend it for you to give you some idea of what kind of a mentality we are dealing with. So the question, though, is what should we make of this? How should we react to it? Uh, so let me start off with a few facts. The first fact is they cannot do what they are threatening to do. It's, it's comforting, I think, to know that. They do not have nuclear-tipped long-range missiles are not likely to for some time. Uh, secondly, they have only a few nu nuclear weapons, 
and we do not believe that they are configured so that they can be mounted on missiles. And third, and perhaps most importantly, their conventional forces would be decisively defeated in any conflict with the Republic of Korea, with only minor assistance from the United States in terms of air and naval forces. Having said that, there's a huge but. And the but is they have the capacity to do considerable damage with the conventional military forces. They have hundreds of medium-range missiles, and even with conventional explosive warheads, they can do a lot of damage to both South Korea and Japan. Perhaps even more importantly, they have massed hundreds of field artillery just north of the DMZ and within range of Seoul. They have special operation forces, which can do a lot of damage. They have chemical weapons that can do a lot of damage. And finally, there was a question, if in a military conflict in North Korea, if that were ever to happen, China would certainly be a wild card. My own belief is that China would not involve itself if North Korea were clearly seen as the aggressor. Well, my sum on North Korea is that the danger is not what they are threatening. That is more of a bluff, more of big talk than it is serious. But there is a very real danger that they might feel obliged to do some military provocation of the kind they've done several times in the last few years. And I must say that in the environment today, I believe if that were to happen, South Korea would react strongly, maybe even overreact. So we have the danger of an escalation complicated by the fact that the somewhat under 30,000 U.S. military forces in Korea are now in a change, going through a change of command. So we have, still have the responsibility for the command of the, of the combined forces, but they are, we are sort of running out of the ability to, to affect that responsibility. So what is the possibility of a U.S.-China conflict? Some historians and politicians have argued that conflict is inevitable when a new rising power challenges the established dominant power. And they cite England and Germany at the end of the 19th century as an example of this. But such a conflict would be catastrophic to both countries. And the leaders of both countries do really understand that. Our two countries are locked today into a mutual economic dependency. We are deterred from conflict by a sort of mutual assured economic destruction. But we should not be complacent. History tells us that we should never underestimate the ability of a country to act against its own best interests. And there are dynamic forces in place that threaten the accord between our two countries. Thankfully, as Mike Armacost has said this morning, Taiwan has receded as one of those uh, potential problem areas. But in the meantime, disputes have intensified around smaller islands in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea. The economic and strategic value of these islands is low, but the emotional heat over them is very high. In my assessment, incredibly high. Additionally, U.S. industry today is being attacked by cyber hack hackers based in China. Billions of dollars of intellectual property have been stolen, and probing attacks have been made against some of our economic infrastructure. Our government has accused the Chinese government of being behind these attacks. If that is so, the Chinese government is playing a dangerous game, for it is not difficult to imagine these cyber attacks getting out of control and leading to conflict. My bottom line on China, U.S. relations, is that since the economic miracle of the Asia Pacific depends on the peace and stability of the region, it also depends on the U.S. forces being maintained there but that that peace could be disrupted by North Korea provocation, it could be disrupted by a conflict over the small islands, or it could be uh, disrupted by a cyber attack getting out of control. What should we do about that? I believe the U.S. government and the Chinese government should conduct a deeper and much more serious dialogue on security issues than we have in the past. And whether or not that happens, the scholars in this room who work with China should work harder on the track two of the unofficial dialogue, calling for new ideas and new ways of approaching the problem and emphasizing the importance of our mutual relationship. I'm going to end with an epilogue, not in national security directly. 
besides the national security issues between the United States, we also have global climate issues. The United States has <clears throat> contributed increasing, ever-increasing amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere up until three or four years ago. And then a miracle of sorts is happening. For the last three or four years, our CO2 contribution has been decreasing. It's 20 percent less now than it was three or four years ago. That's the good news. The bad news is China is on a trajectory to double their CO2 contribution uh, in the next two decades. That's a big problem for China. They understand that and they're working hard to try to deal with it, but not successfully to try to deal with it. <clears throat> but it also is a problem for, for the United States and for the rest of the world. It would be a great opportunity for the United States to share the technology with China on how we are reducing our CO2. That would be not only a real benefit to global climate, but it also would have a bonus in that it would create an environment of cooperation and trust that could be extended, hopefully, into the national security area today and to the problems that I've discussed in the national security area today. Thank you very much. I would like to join uh, the celebration of the 30th anniversary of um, APARC, uh, especially since uh, I've had uh, my own association with APARC uh, as a visitor uh, of APARC and Stanford University back in 1992 and 1995. Uh, between those two occasions, I served as um, uh, uh, in the Korean government. Um, and uh, I can t think of only uh, one reason why uh, the president-elect, uh, President Kim Young-sam, uh, asked me to serve as his foreign minister because he must have heard that I, I had uh, visited, had been, been visiting uh, APARC uh, for <laughs> one quarter uh, in that same year, which was 1992. Uh, and I just thought of another reason he might, uh, why he might have asked me to serve as his minister. Uh, the other reason was that in the late 1960s, I was going to school, graduate school at Berkeley across the bay, and uh, I was asked to serve uh, just briefly as, uh, as the interpreter for, uh, at that time, Mr. Kim Young-sam, who was on an exile uh, during the uh, Park Chung-hee uh, government, uh, when he was speaking uh, to a class at Stanford. And uh, I remember the class was at that time taught by a Professor Emerson, who happened to be, I think, uh, Don Emerson's father. And so uh, those are the only two reasons, uh, Stanford related, why I was asked to serve as uh, his foreign minister uh, <laughs> at that time. Um, the current uh, Park government, uh, government of uh, Park Geun-hye uh, was inaugurated barely two months ago. And uh, uh, that, that government and President Park uh, herself are facing serious foreign and security challenges. Coming from dealing with North Korea and dealing with relations with um, China, the United States, and Japan. And uh, as much as uh, time as I, I might have, I, I will uh, try to cover those issues. Um, the South Korean foreign minister uh, recently said the month of April has been an atrocious one diplomatically for South Korea, what with the bellicosity of North Korea and what I would call pivot to the right of the Abe government in Japan. Um, the North Korean government under the uh, new leader, the young leader, Kim Jong-un, uh, has uh, shown to be uh, very bellicose and blustering. Uh, they have been taking issue 
with the UN Security Council resolution uh, on sanctions uh, over the testing of their uh, third uh, nuclear bomb. Um, and uh, North Korea has been taking issue with uh, the uh, joint U.S. ROK military exercise of Key Resolve and uh, the Fall Eagle, which uh, lasted for uh, now about six uh, weeks, which ended uh, as of uh, last month. Um, during that period, North Korea announced that they would um, renounce, they did uh, renounce uh, the armistice of 1953. They cut off all hotline, cold line communication between North and South Korea official ones, uh, especially uh, the, the uh, communication between the military, uh, the two militaries of North and South Korea. Uh, they revoked the non-aggression declaration of 1991. They nullify the North South Korean nuclear, uh, non-nuclear declaration of 1991. Uh, there have been threats of war, uh, even nuclear attack. And uh, they recently, they, uh, they virtually closed off the Kaesong industrial complex uh, where they have been making a lot of money and the South Korean companies have been producing uh, goods uh, to the uh, extent of uh, the, the, uh, spending and earning as much as $500 million a year. Um, now, the question that uh, arises is uh, there is a lot more uh, for North Korea to lose especially with the uh, close, uh, closure, whether it's a temporary one or a permanent one, of the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Um, the, um, because of their blustering, bellicosity, and also closing of uh, the Kaesong Industrial Complex, they will be uh, immediately getting less economic assistance from abroad. They will be uh, getting uh, much less, uh, if any, investment from abroad. Uh, in, in fact, even from China, uh, there have been a curtailing of uh, tourists, of uh, investments, of, of, of trade. And so, um, in the economic area, uh, clearly, uh, those people who are involved primarily in, uh, in uh, economics uh, would be uh, very worried about uh, how the, the uh, Kim Jong-un government is carrying on the relationship vis-a-vis -vis South Korea, the United States, and the rest of the world. And uh, even though the North Korea does expect that China will not abandon North Korea, uh, still uh, the, the China has shown uh, its uh, displeasure, and uh, certainly it uh, hasn't helped uh, with North Korea's relations with, uh, with China. Um, it also contributed to strengthening the military posture uh, or an alliance of the United States and the Republic of Korea. Um, so obviously, uh, the, what the, the question arises, what, uh, what do they uh, have to gain? And uh, there must be those who are advocating such policy. Uh, and uh, what are they saying uh, in defense of the kind of uh, policy and uh, behavior that they've been exhibiting. Um, clearly, uh, it is uh, the product of what I would call a convenience of marriage between Kim Jong-un, the new leader, and the hardline uh, clique, uh, with, particularly within the military. And uh, those who are pu uh, pushing for this kind of policy uh, will be arguing that this is good for you, uh, the, 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 Mr. Kim. Uh, 
uh, for uh, to uh, bolster your your stature. Uh, you, you can be shown that you are standing up to uh, not only uh, to this big power, the United States, but also even to China, which is uh, obviously trying very hard to uh, restrain and, uh, and lead uh, North Korea to uh, a more pragmatic and uh, more stable uh, form of behavior. Um, they will also say that um, th th such policy uh, will demonstrate that uh, North Korea has crossed the threshold of vulnerability as far as uh, um, its uh, nuclear weapons and missile ca uh, capabilities are concerned, uh, that they have reached mm -hmm. what, um, what the Israelis would call, uh, regarding <coughs> Iran, uh, the, the so-called zone of immunity, that uh, they have crossed uh, this uh, line where the other parties cannot uh, attack North Korea for whatever infringement that they get into. So um, we can see uh, the, the language, uh, those of you who don't understand Korean uh, are very lucky because you don't really uh, hear uh, the kind of vituperation, bluffing, empty threats and a very, very uh, uncivilized uh, kind of uh, choice of words that they're using. Uh, they are throwing out the last ounce or vestige of respect, uh, credibility, or decency. And uh, so uh, if they do, in fact, have uh, an end game, uh, it, it is a very difficult uh, thing to understand. Uh, I would think that uh, the, the South Korean government, in dealing with the Kaesong Industrial Complex, decided that for two reasons. Uh, they, they first have to evacuate all the Korean, South Korean personnel from that area, and as of now, uh, all but seven of them uh, have returned uh, to South Korea, abandoning all the equipment, all, all, all the factory uh, facilities, and uh, uh, th th even the products that they, they ha had made uh, at that, uh, that time. And the reason is, uh, that uh, I think the South Korean government uh, wanted to uh, show uh, to the North Koreans that uh, they should find out who has more to lose by closing uh, the Kaesong uh, Industrial Complex. And secondly, uh, South Korea would, uh, uh, most importantly, to, uh, uh, to remove the, uh, what I would call the South Korean hostages who are uh, in, in that complex uh, uh, with whom it would, would be very difficult to carry out any other kind of uh, uh, the, the policy or, uh, or position. Um, so um, whatever the explanation is, uh, this is a very uh, unstable situation, although I don't think it will necessarily lead to uh, anything uh, militarily uh, very dangerous at this time because the North Koreans know very well, as well as the rest of us, that uh, any real uh, military provocation uh, will be uh, tantamount to committing suicide on their part. Now, what has been the South Korean response so far? Uh, it's uh, the, the first uh, line of defense or response has been to strengthen the uh, alliance w with the United States, which is uh, already quite robust and and, and, and firm, uh, but at the same time, the new government, new South Korean government, has shown willingness 
to uh, negotiate and propose uh, dialogue. Uh, in the broader name of trust building, but uh, at the same time, uh, specifically on issues such as uh, Kaesong and other issues of North Korean complaint and interest. Uh, the president herself said, said that uh, we have to talk with them to find out what exactly they want and why they are doing all these things. And uh, they, they uh, were sending these messages uh, through uh, China as well as uh, uh, to, uh, of course, uh, collaborating and coordinating with the uh, United States. Um, but in South Korea, there are also uh, hardliners, uh, people who advocate uh, more hardline uh, response to North Korea uh, among politicians, among journalists, and uh, the, even uh, the, some uh, academics uh, whose uh, slogans uh, are mainly, number one, we should have uh, all the options on the table. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, we should um, uh, deal with uh, North Korea in a tit-for-tat fashion. Uh, uh, some of them even talk about a, a nuclear option for South Korea. They also advocate uh, the return of tactical nuclear weapons, uh, which had been uh, withdrawn back in uh, 1991 during the uh, senior, uh, the, the, the first uh, the President Bush's term, and uh, they were even ad advocating uh, the, the regime change in uh, North Korea as the fundamental way out of the current impasse. Uh, fortunately, the government uh, is not joining in. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, who are trying to make, uh, utilize these uh, arguments uh, by uh, showing to the Chinese that uh, uh, under these circumstances, it would be helpful if China uh, takes a more positive step toward uh, uh, dealing with, uh, with North Korea. Um, okay. So, um, the, the question that still remains is um, what uh, kind of uh, coordination uh, we, we can carry on with the United States and whether uh, uh, China uh, and, and how much uh, China will uh, get itself uh, involved. Uh, I'm sorry about the management of time. I'll stop here, but uh, if you have any okay. further questions, Thank I'll. You very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to offer my congratulations on this uh, great milestone, the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Asia Pacific uh, Research Center here at Stanford University. It fills, fills me a pride and a pleasure to be invited to be a panelist on such a momentous occasion. I'm so glad to see uh, all, uh, see uh, my old friends here. Uh, Thirty years ago, I was a visiting uh, a scholar, young visiting scholar, I say, at the Center for Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan. My host was M Professor Mike Oxenberg. Uh, I really learned a lot from him. Mike's uh, final work place, or wo uh, final work place, was here at Arbuck. Uh, just before he passed away, I participated in the Oxenberg seminar here at APAC. Uh, which had been uh, planned by Andy, Jean, uh, and uh, I shall never forget uh, our farewell hug. 
on that occasion. So uh, uh, I'm taking part in this uh, seminar today in order to repay the debt of uh, the gratitude to Mike. Uh, since the dawn of the uh, 20th century, uh, U.S.-China-Japan uh, relations have uh, represented a key elements of international relations in Asia. The relationship has gone through four phases. The first phase uh, coincided with the first half of the 20th century. Uh, during this period, Japan rose rapidly to prominence and, and, and entered the ranks of the major powers. Before long, however, it began to engage in acts of hegemonism. This culminated in his hostility between Japan and the United States, uh, chiefly in regard to the issue of China, and then to conflict between them in the Pacific Ocean. In short, in this phase, U.S.-China-Japan relations pitted the United States and China against Japan. The second phase consisted of the first half of the Cold War period that followed uh, World War II up to the U.S.-China rapprochement in 1972. Although there was a U.S.-Soviet dimension to the Cold War in Asia, it was essentially a Cold War between the United States and PRC on the mainland. After, after World War II, Japan had disavowed, uh, disavowed uh, its pre-war militarism. And then Japan and the United States concluded security treaty, and both countries became allies. Thus, uh, this phase pitted Japan and the United States against China. The third phase consisted of the latter half of the Cold War period from 1972 until the end of the Cold War in 1989. The year 1972 saw a sudden rapprochement between the United States and China, the two countries being brought together by the Soviet Union. In response to these uh, movements, Japan too swiftly normalized diplomatic relations with PRC. This served to establish a structure that aligned uh, Japan, United States, and China against the Soviet Union. The fourth phase commenced in the 1990s after the end of the Cold War and through, the, through to the present. After the breakup of the Soviet Union, the balance abusing within US, China, Japan relations became somewhat delicate. In our years of uh, the first 21st century, Managing U.S.-China-Japan uh, relations has become more difficult as the uh, limitations of uh, the U.S. economy uh, began to be revealed, while uh, China's presence has become increasingly significant and Japan's presence has withered as it has uh, struggled to recover in the aftermath of the bubble economy. In this sense, the three countries have been missing a uh, glue for consolidating among them. Let us uh, take a brief uh, look at uh, the present bilateral relations uh, between each pair of countries. In the 1990s, the USA and China established a strategic partnership based on the policy of engagement. And at the start of the 21st century, the U USA came to the China, regard, chi regard China as a responsible stakeholder in the international system. The current Obama administration faces a whole uh, host of domestic challenges, principally economic issues. In terms of a relation with China, in short, run, in short run, it appears to be essentially sticking to the doctrine of strategic partnership and China's stakeholder. Although in the long run, it does harbor a certain wariness regarding China's rapid ascendance to superpower status and the posture that it has, it has adopted in the course of uh, its rise. Although Japan-U.S. Uh, relations do, of course, uh, involve certain problems, such as the issue of uh, U.S. military bases in Okinawa, I'm sure that the two nations would maintain their strong uh, partnership in the future. A Japanese government survey found that uh, over 80% of uh, the Japanese people felt an affinity with the United States. The Japanese people or still vividly recall the U.S. military operation Tomodachi in the aftermath of the Great East Asia, East Japan uh, earthquake and tsunami. Uh, more than anything else, the fact that uh, the relationship, the trust between the two people is still 
are growing almost 70 years after the end of uh, the war is testament to the strengths of the U.S.-Japan relations. The key problems is uh, Sino-Japanese relations, as you may know. Uh, Prime Minister Abe and President Hu Jintao reached a consensus on strategic and reciprocal relationship in 2006, uh, which was expected uh, more future-oriented uh, rather than focusing on the history or Taiwan. A new formula of the relationship was successful, and both leaders became silent about those uh, issues since 2006. Premier Un Chapao visited Japan in 2007 and gave a historical speech at the National Diet of Japan. He spoke Chinese uh, government and the people appreciated the apologies Japanese government had done many times before. Then Hu Jintao visited Japan in 2008 and he agreed to joint development of resources in East China Sea. China had already been engaged. But things suddenly changed uh, in uh, 2010. Apart from history and Taiwan issues, a new agenda, the Senkak uh, in Chinese, became a most uh, crucial agenda by an accidental fishing boat collision. The Senkak became a hot issue again in 2012. Tokyo Governor Ishiwara Shintaro negotiated with a private owner of the islands and decided to buy those uh, through people's uh, donation. Then a Prime Minister Noda of DPJ concerned this would cause serious trouble with China and he decided to buy those islands by government money. The Chinese government was uh, rather quiet for the first five months but the Chinese government suddenly started criticizing the Noda government. The Chinese government asserted this has been a serious, serious change of status quo, while Japanese government maintained this was for strength, strengthening uh, the status quo. Why has the friction between the two countries increased to the point where it has become such a major issue, despite the fact that the relationship between Japan and China is becoming increasingly interdependent. The standard answer to this question frames the issue in terms of a power shift or a power transition. The reversal in the power balance between the Japan and China has certainly been rapid. In the year 2000, Japan's GDP was four times that of China. Yet in 2010, China surpassed Japan in terms of GDP size. Originally, it had been predicted that uh, this would occur sometime between the years 2020 and 2025. I'd like to rather emphasize that the domestic politics in both Japan and China has a marked effect on the friction between the two countries. The past 10 years, have been seen eight different Japanese prime ministers swearing. Thus, a change of administration in Japan no longer comes as any surprise. It becomes impossible for either domestic politics or foreign policy to develop properly under the strong leadership. It is also the case that in China policy toward Japan, uh, soon becomes intertwined with the domestic politics, particularly power struggles. And there is, unfortunately, always a tendency to make Japan the scapegoat. But since the last year, the China's leadership transition being uh, began and the Xi Jinping administration has started. In this process, there was a very serious power struggle over the leadership of the 18th Party Congress. Until last summer, Hu Jintao's group was relatively powerful uh, particularly after the Chongqing and the Poshi Lai's affair. After, but after the Beidai Hub meeting in August, the situation suddenly changed. Hu Jintao lost in his game. And Jiang Zemin's faction won and dominated top positions. Until then, the Senkak was rather calm. But the Chinese government suddenly became very tough against Japan and reduction to use the word strategic and reciprocal 
relationship, which was originally produced by Hu Jintao. It clearly shows how the domestic politics affected their policy towards Japan. In my view, Japan's policy towards China since normalization of diplomatic relations in 1972 has essentially been crept. During its reclusive era under the socialist regime, uh, China repeatedly engaged in a kind of a carnage that took place during the Cultural Revolution. In 1979, Japan began providing economic aid to China in the form of ODA. It did so with the aim of encouraging China to follow its pledging course of reform and open instead of regressing. Japan was the first of the G7 nations to resume assistance to China after the Tiananmen in 1989. Japan's objective was to avoid isolating China and put uh, the country back on its path of reform and opening. This would seem to have been proved effective to some extent, since in 1992, China changed its track and uh, opted for the market economy based on the socialism. Japan also actively promoted China's accession to the WTO, which took place in 2001. In short, Japan sought to make China a member of the international community by drawing, drawing it into the international system. Even now, Japan should maintain the fundamentals of its policy toward China. This is my view. China now stands at the crossroad. It has reached a critical moment at which it will decide how it will engage the rest of the world, either under international norms or under the Chinese norms. <coughs> Historically, China took the first step in internationalization by developing relations with Japan. As it first increased in its exchange with Japan, outbreaks of friction were frequent. In overcoming this with Japan, uh, however, China became internationalized. In short, diplomacy with Japan was for China the first real test for internationalization. Finally, as the Asia Pacific region undergoes dynamic change, many factors of instability still persist and it will likely to take a while, while, a while to mend relations between Japan and China. In that sense, U.S. presence in the Asia Pacific region, whatever pivot or rebalancing, is without doubt essential to the regional stability and represent public goods, both, public goods, both in the political and economic terms. As far as Japan is concerned, the nation must, uh, above all, uh, revitalize its economy and instill a sense of self-confidence in the Japanese people. The minimum condition that will be necessary in order to achieve these ends is uh, stable and powerful political leadership. The Asia-Pacific region will undoubtedly face further changes during the next 30 years, and I believe the future role and the responsibility of APAC, APAC will be greater. I look forward to ever evolving role of APAC. APAC. Thank you. Well, let me uh, join my colleagues uh, uh, to congratulate the 30th anniversary of our part. Uh, I have also personally have been, uh, been involved in some activities, uh, uh, particularly the, the Kyoto uh, Stanford Dialogue, which I benefited a great deal. Uh, uh, since the, uh, the theme of the, uh, 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 the symposium is Asia's rise, I, I would also just like to offer a, a very uh, uh, brief uh, observation on, on Asia. Uh, in the last few years, uh, as the um, IDRC board member, I've uh, visited many uh, Asian countries. I, I have to say that indeed, I think, of course, uh, all, we all recognize that Asia's a miracle, as uh, I think outlined by, uh, by uh, uh, Larry uh, this morning. Uh, but I also had, I think that uh, a, uh, Asia is uh, such a complex uh, uh, region that as uh, uh, Gasper uh, this morning, uh, I mean, you know, in the earlier session asked what's the common denominator, denominators of, uh, of Asia. Uh, in fact, I think you see, if you think about the, uh, the diversity of ethnicity, the, of, of the culture, uh, polit uh, political systems, and so on, I think one could also say that Asia's success 
is also a, uh, uh, not just a, an economic uh, miracle, but also a political uh, miracle, uh, a miracle of tolerance, coexistence, and cooperation. So I think that actually uh, the current disputes on, uh, uh, you know, I, I, in, in both in terms of Diaoyu Island and, uh, and in South China Sea, I think that in the long run probably are just you know, part of the growing pains uh, that in the long run that I think Asians will find solutions. Uh, now, I think also, I think uh, there's uh, uh, quite a bit of discussion about China's emergence uh, uh, in recent years. I think now if I look back about the, uh, the, so the narratives of China's rise and emergency, I, I would have to say that first of all, it's an uh, imported product. I think uh, uh, probably I think in terms of you know, the, the coin of the term of the, the BRIC uh, countries and also China's rise was mostly actually uh, 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 first started, you know, the discussion was started overseas. And gradually I think then, uh, I think people in China began to feel, maybe there, I, I think initially there was some people arguing this is a, you know, just another plot, just trying to, uh, to uh, you know, to to get China uh, Chinese people to uh, um, to be proud and, and you know and to to uh, uh, to uh, uh, pay more in the international uh, on the climate change and other things. So people do not necessarily actually pay much attention to it. But then I think increasingly I think there are more people are talking about this, and I think some people indeed are beginning to to feel indeed uh, you know people begin to to feel good and and to join the uh, discussion. But I think in, in many of the sort of the uh, uh, policy discussion, I, I was with some, uh, you know, sometimes some very senior leaders. I think uh, uh, people are very clear about the daunting challenge China is facing. So in fact, I think that uh, uh, at, at least I think that uh, in, in the uh, domestic issues are still uh, tops the uh, the policy agenda of the of the leadership. Uh, so not just to mention, you know, for example, the, now the, the slowing down of the economics and, uh, and the, of the economy and the uh, increasing problems of the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the environment and, uh, you know, the depletion and the energy security. And so you name it. I think every day, I think, uh, you know, you see there are various kind of emergencies of various scales uh, that emerge. So I think the, if you're a leader in China, that's the issue you have to face every day. So I think that uh, to, um, to uh, uh, you know, in terms of international relationship, I think that uh, the, the both previous leadership, I mean, you know, previous leadership have been criticized for being too reactive. Uh, because I think our, you know, as, as Deng Xiaoping has said, that the overall strategy is trying to, to create a, a peaceful uh, environment for China so that China can focus on its internal development. And I think that, has, that overall posture has not changed, uh, as I uh, understand. Uh, so I think uh, uh, you know, there are, of course, various uh, interpretations of the recent disputes. But I think, in general, I don't think that the uh, uh, a, a, uh, uh, issues uh, that uh, uh, you know, China feels good, that now China is trying to flex its muscle. I think it's uh, uh, probably opposite to, to the truth. I think China still wants to maintain the status quo and trying to, uh, uh, to maintain a, a, a peaceful environment. Uh, in, in fact, so much so that to the, to the degree that I saw which, very recently there was a report by Lowy Institute of International Policy and basically criticizing uh, of, uh, of Chinese leadership of being too preoccupied uh, with domestic issues that Chinese foreign policy uh, is being too reactive and that may have serious consequence because of the a potential explosive, uh, explosive nature of China's disputes uh, with Japan and with the uh, China, uh, South China Sea. So I, I think that uh, uh, that's sort of probably my own observation of the, uh, on China's rise. Now I think that since our panel's issue is more on the US-China relationship, uh, I think that first of all, we all probably recognize that uh, the engagement uh, of China with US has grown uh, so much over the last 30 years. Um, I think that uh, probably, as our uh, speaker have mentioned before, that you know, in the in the 70s is more, of, you know, more of a strategic concern of you know the the Cold War 
Uh, but now I think has, um, uh, China has become every uh, aspect uh, of the U.S. Uh, 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 activities. You know, I was saddened to, to see that actually in Boston explosion of the three casualties, one of them actually is a Chinese student. So that to a certain degree shows how much you know, uh, the two countries have linked together. I was also happy to see actually today for this particular uh, seminar, I saw my friend, uh, uh, my roommate uh, of 20, uh, 28 years ago that uh, we were uh, uh, roommates in, at SUNY Stony Brook. Uh, this again, it, it just shows the, the kind of a, 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 a how deep uh, the two countries has been, uh, 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 you know, uh, the relationship Hadib has, has run into. But at the same time, then what one, the question why, given such a broad engagement, given such deep roots, why is there still this perceived distrust among the two government, uh, among the two, uh, two countries? I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have to elaborate on this, and there are, uh, you know, uh, people have written on this, and particularly, you know, the one by Ken Libasso and, and uh, 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 you know, a, a Chinese scholar. And, and so I, as a policy analyst, uh, I would offer uh, some observations of, of why that's the case. I think there are some major fault lines of the, in terms of the policy engagement among the two countries. Or maybe you can say as asymmetry of the institutions. I think first of all, I think when you think about the normal setup of the uh, foreign establishments, I think that in the in the U.S., of course, the, the uh, State Department and also the National Secu Security Advisors versus on the China side, it's the sort of Minister of Foreign Affairs and also the State Counselors. Uh, I think that uh, one problem here, I think, is that uh, on the China side, usually, I think the uh, uh, once the foreign minister is appointed usually he or she, she, I mean, mostly he, I mean, so far has been he, uh, would serve, uh, you know, at least five to 10 years. Uh, that has been, so they've been very stable. On the U.S. side, I think uh, it's uh, uh, quite to the contrary. I think that uh, uh, particularly, for example, the people who, who you know, work with China uh, that have been changed very quite frequently. And, uh, you know, uh, um, for example, I know that uh, 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 you know, on the on the uh, uh, you know Obama administration when when first Obama came to the, you know uh, to the office and they are uh, you know people who worked you know on China issue and uh, without actually for, uh, serving for the full term and they they left and then some new people come so that I think uh, is one thing that sometimes actually uh, uh, makes the uh, relationship uh, 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 stable somewhat difficult. And, and the second issue, I think, is related to the, uh, the decision-making process. I think, of course, uh, uh, people always think about the China. Okay, uh, people always think about China as uh, you know one man makes the decision. Uh, the uh, you know the, the president uh, would, uh, would uh, make the whole decision, uh, but that's really far from the truth. The other day, I had a discussion with Masaoki, Aoki, professor, uh, you know, Professor uh, Masaoki. And Masa said maybe the, the best way to describe China's situation is that China has a, sort of like a corporate board, as a poly, the standing committee of the Politburo. There are uh, previously nine members, and now there are seven members. So each of them actually do have a very important say in important relationships, such as the, the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, so I think, uh, but of course, when the U.S. president or the key people visiting China, most most likely they're going to meet, meet with the president and sometimes with PM, premier, but very rarely would they meet other policy makers in that important group. And the third, I think, I, I think the, uh, another very serious uh, problem is the, on the Congress. In the U.S., the Congress has been a major force now in shaping uh, U.S.-China relationships, partly because of the engagement is so deep. It's not just a foreign relations, so there are many issues that really concerns the U.S. domestic issues that, that in, the, the Congress have re, in, indeed become a very part of the player in the, in the decision making, such as you know, adding reviews on China's investment in, uh, in the U.S., such as but by blocking um, OSTP and NASA to spend uh, uh, the federal money to engage with China. 
and so on. So there are, uh, you know, many of this sort of issue that Congress actually played an important role. However, uh, uh, the Congress, uh, the congressional people, have really had much uh, formal engagement with the uh, Chinese in establishment. I've actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, seen some, you know, uh, senators or representatives, uh, you know, congressmen visiting China as a very brief visits and so on, but rarely in any sort of substantive, very deep di discussion. And I think that, uh, of course, when Chinese officials, when they come to the U.S., they also engage with the State Department and with the, their counterparts. Rarely would they also visit the, U the U.S. Congress. So I think there's a you know, great asymmetry there that uh, somehow that uh, we have not uh, paid much, much attention to, but I think uh, uh, we need to. Uh, I've actually met with some congressional aides uh, who visited China you know, in, in terms of trying to understand what's going on in China. I think these are very bright young people, uh, many with very distinguished sort of, you know, backgrounds and so on. But at the same time, they are too young to understand the complexity of the politics in China. So, uh, and, and often when they visit, they often try to visit, say, the, uh, more of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the uh, dis, you know, uh, dissidents and other things. So they try to really, I think, they uh, 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 engage with, with, you know, sort of uh, uh, a much broader uh, group of uh, uh, the people, uh, 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 you know, they, they, uh, they select rather than the, the uh, uh, more, uh, uh, for so this, uh, uh, discussion. So I think uh, uh, those sort of issues, I think, uh, uh, complicates the, uh, the issue. Uh, not to even to mention that even uh, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the U.S., uh, many of the major policy public understanding of China issue was dominated by particular special interest groups. I think they is, you know, can run sort of effectively using the political uh, uh, you know, system in, in the U.S. to to make those issues as so sort of, you know uh, a major ones uh, a, a, rather than so sort of, you know uh, uh, you know I mean often it, strategically those may not be as important as those issues said. On the China side, there are also ad, ad hoc factors that are increasingly the the issues have been uh, can be uh, the public sentiment can be uh, diverted uh, and can be influenced by Weibo. Uh, uh, you know, we have some very influential uh, people whose Weibo ha can, you know, have uh, millions of uh, followers. So uh, any sort of one uh, sentence they say that would have uh, uh, very uh, strong re reactions. I think uh, the, uh, the the issue with with Japan, I think certainly was was part of that uh, the victim of, of that part. So I, I think that uh, uh, all of this I think made the uh, effective policy dialogue and engagement much more challenging than one, one uh, uh, would think. Uh, I've personally uh, you know, participated in the uh, strategic dialogue, uh, 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 the uh, you know, sort of the uh, innovation dialogue, which is becomes, has become part of the uh, strategic uh, economic dialogue. And, I, and what I found was surprising is that um, given all the efforts that have been put into uh, usually, I think the meeting was, uh, at the most, uh, you know, a, a full day. Uh, with the morning session, mostly was, you know, different agencies, you know, making their uh, statement, official statement, and with very rare, you know, sort of exchange of, uh, of uh, opinions or the, the discussion or debates. And then maybe in the later in the afternoon, there will be industry people, then there will be some discussion there and, and so on. So I've proposed that uh, we need to add an expert group to the discussion so that actually the experts on both sides can work together on some sort of important issues to, uh, uh, to suggest to the policymakers. And that was done, now, uh, now we ha do have uh, a, a, a group. Uh, but unfortunately, I think that uh, the shorter meeting, and the sh you know, the, particularly the shallow part, uh, has not uh, been able to be changed because I think uh, 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 that's sort of the, the, the nature of those sort of dialogues. So unless we find ways to remedy uh, the, uh, the asymmetry of those fault lines, the, the, those asymmetries, and also try to find ways to, uh, 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 to, to find effective, better effective ways to, to communicate, I think that, that uh, uh, mistrust will probably 
continue. I'll, I'll save my uh, 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 suggestions for the latter because I was uh, warned that I have to stop. Thank you. I have seen the growth of the region since the 70s into the 80s, into the 90s. And it was Henry Kissinger, another secretary, who made this observation that East Asia, as far as economic growth, Professor Lau, as far as technological advances, as far as business opportunity investment, East Asia, he said this at the middle of the 80s, East Asia is equivalent to 20th century Europe. But as far as systems, institutions, and processes that would settle the differences among themselves and between themselves, he said East Asia is still 19th century Europe. And that's exactly the observation and the void that a collection of small and medium-sized countries like ASEAN, 10, from Indonesia to the smallest Brunei, have been trying to help. Because major players on the landscape have historical baggage that they need to resolve before they can really get on to become the nucleus of growth, of evolution like France and like Germany, which have gone through tremendous catastrophes in their history. So the task of building institutions and processes and systems of managing potential conflicts in the region of East Asia has been placed upon the shoulders of an institution like ASEAN. Now, by itself, by ourselves, 2.4 trillion US dollars GDP combined. Bigger than Korea's, bigger than India's, bigger than Australia and New Zealand's putting together. So, in and of itself, it is a medium-sized economic weight. In 2010, during the second summit between the US and the ASEAN member states, Mr. Obama had this to say. If we, the US, will get out of our own crisis, we will have to sell more, we will have to export more. We look around, where are the markets, where are the consumers? It's you in East Asia, you in Southeast Asia. That's why the first stop of the new Secretary of State in 2009, Hillary Clinton, it's Asia, to the surprise of a lot of you. And this happened before the word pivoting toward East Asia was used after the winding down of the engagement in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq. So the middle class is growing. The purchasing power is rising. What are the issues? What are the problems? What are the challenges that would deserve U.S continued engagement. That's what you want to hear. Definitely, norms are being set in Southeast Asia and East Asia as a whole. The issue between ASEAN and China is the South China Sea. We are working on the code of conduct. We are working on the code of conduct. The implication is the place is still rather undefined, particularly from the point of view of the ASEAN member states, particularly on the claimants on the ASEAN states, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Brunei. From the perspective of China, this part of the territory may be 3 million, 4 million square kilometers. This part of the territory is already under the Chinese sovereignty. But the fact that it is still being, the code of conduct is being drafted, it means that we certainly would like to leave the issue of actual delineation 
of the territorial lines into the future, much like Mr. Teng Xiaoping advised and admonished us that this issue probably will have to be deferred into the future when the future generations are probably more wise than us. So we are hoping that the norms of state relations could be established and it would be best if the international community, U.S. included, would lend us support in creating those norms, those values of the rule of law, of the games, to govern international relations in the region. The, you know, half of ASEAN, Don, and I'm glad you are with the Abbasi Center for Islamic Research here, half of the 600 million population of ASEAN would be Muslims. More than half would be speaking Malay. But it is a kind of Islamic tradition that is more accommodating, more flexible, and more open and more progressive. I have always said the road to peace and reconciliation between the West and the Muslim world might very well run through ASEAN and Southeast Asia. So I would, in, I would urge that you will continue to engage with the countries of Southeast Asia on this dimension too, the Islamic dimension of Southeast Asia. Of course there are extremists among our midst, but if you compare that with the rest, South Asia, North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, the Muslims, the largest Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. The Muslims are relatively accommodating and open and progressive. The U.S. has been supportive to ASEAN, and I hope you will continue to be supportive to ASEAN, because this is the fulcrum, fulcrum of power plays in East Asia. When we are building the systems and the institutions and the processes effective enough, but at this moment, it will have to be the ASEAN mechanism, ASEAN Regional Forum, threatening none, no historical baggage with too many of the big powers, but accommodating, accommodating all. The Chinese and the Japanese have problems. Chinese and the Koreans have problems. Japanese and Koreans have problems. Chinese and Indians have problems. It's the ASEAN countries who don't have much problems with anyone. <laughs> so small, medium size, a collection of countries welcoming all and threatening none. The Bush administration has somehow ignored us because of the preoccupation with Iraq and with Afghanistan. But when the Obama administration came in, it has decided to re-engage with East Asia. And the first step, the door, the gate into East Asia for that re-engagement was ASEAN. Why? Precisely what I just said. Only official forum region-wide. ASEAN Regional Forum, 21 members. ASEAN plus our dialogue partners. It was born in 1994. It was rather dormant. It's a place where you speak, but you don't take action. But in 2010, in Hanoi, it was a place where the issue of the South China Sea came out in the open. Very heated debate. I was present in the first, I was present at this time as Secretary General. For the first time I felt, oh, the ASEAN Regional Forum is relevant after all. Since that outburst of the issue into the open about the South China Sea, you have seen the issue being taken more seriously 
by the players and by the world. So the re-entry of the US pivoting toward East Asia officially has to be the ASEAN Regional Forum. And that's exactly what Secretary Clinton did. I have this hope, and only the US and other six, other five members could help strengthen that ASEAN Regional Forum. How, how much more time do I have? I usually speak about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Four minutes. Now that I get going. You see, all the three, all the six members of the six party talks belong to the ASEAN Regional Forum, AIF. But Secretary Perry, Foreign Minister Han Sung Chu, Professor, and Professor, ASEAN Regional Forum, the word ASEAN has never been mentioned in the attempt, in the search, in the efforts to find solution to the problems of the Northeast of Asia, of the Korean Peninsula. I would have wished that all six would have thought, and here is a homework for you, call Washington. <laughs> Why don't we think about an ASEAN roving special envoy, ARF? on the Korean Peninsula, based on my assumption that if North Korea is going to concede to anyone, it won't be to the US. It won't be to Japan, it won't be to, North, to South Korea, it won't be to China, and probably won't be to the Russians, precisely because Southeast Asia, ASEAN, ASEAN Regional Forum, threatening and accommodating all, you might have a chance listening to what North Korea may be willing to concede. I personally brought North Korea into ARF, this forum, ASEAN Regional Forum, in the year 2000. And Madeleine Albright just came down from the Northeast, from the Korean Peninsula, dressed in yellow saying that this is in respect to the sunshine policy of Mr. Kim Dae-jung. It was the first time that I led Mr. Pak, foreign minister of North Korea that time, into the room to the wall of the reporters and the cameras and the flashes. And he was shaking and I told him, you better get used to this. <laughs> this is how the world operates. And ever since, North Korea has been part of that forum. Can Washington, can Moscow, can Beijing, can Seoul convince Pyongyang that maybe ASEAN Regional Forum has a role to play, has a contribution to make. And let me end by showing you this little green book of mine, not of Gaddafi. Mrs. Clinton asked me her first trip to visit the Secretariat. How much, Mr. Secretary General, you mean to implement this little booklet of yours called the ASEAN Charter? Because I think she came from the perspective that the ASEAN member states, leaders come together, sing and dress, sign and go home and forgot about what they said to each other. This time, it's a treaty, binding all of us, and we meant to live by this rule of law. I told her, Madam Secretary, we have to make it a living document. Time is up, and this is the end of the story. I said, we have to make it a li the living document, much like your, your Declaration of Independence. I said, when Thomas Jefferson penned down that great phrase, all men are created equal, he did not include the slaves. He did not include men without property. He did not include women. <laughs> now you are, and now he is. And I said, every successive generation of Americans 
has to appeal to that great document of yours. All men are created equal, now more equal than ever. Every generation has to fight for a larger space, for your larger freedom. 600 million people, 10 countries of ASEAN are doing the same thing. And we can be your great ally in a very, very volatile region. But grow, growing and becoming more important to the world, much like Mr. Obama said. We look around, where are the markets, where are the consumers? You in Southeast Asia, you in Asia. Thank you very much.